Hello, everyone. I am Corey Andrew Powell, and this is another episode of Motivational Mondays. I'm very honored today to be joined by Dana Ty Soon Burgess, an American, uh, a leading American choreographer, dancer, and cultural figure known worldwide as the diplomat of dance. So this year, his DC-based dance company, the Dana Ty Soon Burgess Dance Company, will celebrate its 30th season. Dana, welcome to Motivational Mondays. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, thank you. The pleasure's all ours. And you have a new book out called Chino and the Dance of the Butterfly. And I have to just tell you before we get started that it's such an amazing book because it has so many layers. Like it's a history book almost of like the of different migrations and different interculturalisms between America and other mm -hmm. countries, your own family's migration. I mean, before we even got to you being born, mm -hmm. I was like in love with your mom already. Like <laughs> She was like, you know, so amazing. And then your dad, mm -hmm. and I'm like, wait, the dad was Irish and German, was it? Yes. And spoke Chinese. I'm like, right. I mean, you, you really couldn't miss. you got a lot of uh, textures kind of yes. uh, put upon you that I'm fascinated by. But first to begin with, in your own words, mm -hmm. um, at this time in your life and at the top of your career as you are mm -hmm. right now, uh, why was it important for you to write this book now? Well, it's amazing because the dance company, which I founded, is now in its 30th anniversary year, as you mentioned. And what happened a couple of years ago is that all of a sudden we went to this moment of a great quieting because of the COVID lockdown. And I went from going to the studio every day working with the whole company every day to suddenly teaching them on zoom and, you know, trying to teach and the dogs are running through the living room and I'm knocking over a plant. And, um, and I just had this moment of, Oh my gosh, I need to reflect. This is a moment in time in my life where I need to try and understand what had motivated different parts of my career. What were really seminal moments in my life? who were my mentors. And so I just started writing and I wrote a few chapters and I sent a prospectus to University of New Mexico Press and they were great. They immediately you know, wrote back and said, we would love to um, publish this memoir. So just write it by this date and you know, we'll set it, you up with an editor and we're going to publish. So that's what happened. And it really allowed me to go back to moments in my life and be able to track over decades what the impact of those moments were and those people. Yeah, and it's such a great legacy, as I mentioned. I mean, I know it well for for you. You start your legacy off with your grandparents, who and mm -hmm. I think it was great grandparents. They end up in, in yeah. Hawaii, right? Mm -hmm. uh, end up in Hawaii, and then you know, there's this sort of interesting way you end up in Carmel, but you were not, well, you were born in Carmel, right? And then you went to Santa right. Fe, New Mexico, mm -hmm. and there's all these cultural influences happening that are for you tied into just not like now you're exposed into Hawaiian culture and Japanese culture. And, right. and now you're in the Spanish culture when you get to New Mexico. Um, mm -hmm. And I love this part where you're discussing like how you begin to speak differently because you were adapting like this sort of Spanglish <laughs> pronunciation right. of words and but talk about that kind of inter I guess it's I mean I guess it's more like a multiculturalism that you were experiencing but it's almost like culture shock too I mean what was that like for you I went to bilingual public schools in English and Spanish in the 70s and into the early 80s so I was going from a very kind of Asian American mixed household to speaking half the day in Spanish and English and sort of really speaking Spanglish because what happens is you start not quite communicating perfectly in either one <laughs> language. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, coming home to my family and then going to a martial arts Jojo every night. So that was like another culture where people were then there speaking Japanese. So um, I, learned really quickly that for me, the universal language that brought all these different communities together was actually movement because everybody dances. Everybody knows when someone is um, depressed, you can just see it in their body. You can see when someone is skipping because they're elated. And that is 
this just fundamental language of humanity, which was created and that we all understand on a cellular level um, and, you know, was created before there was written language, before there was spoken language. And that just was the unifying bridge to try and figure out how to move through all these different cultural perspectives. And there were many different, there was Native American, there was Hispanic, there was Japanese, there was Korean, there was Caucasian, you know, it just was this whole mix going on. Well, I love too that you talk about the difference between Santa Fe when you were growing up versus like before Hollywood discovered it. <laughs> you know, I love like, you know, you were there before the Ralph Lauren collection, you know, what I mean? <laughs> so, right. the Santa Fe Ralph Lauren yeah. collection. So, um, but talk about that Santa Fe for you before I was like, before Ralph Lauren got sure. there, right? Well, Santa Fe was really a, um, a small Western town and it was unique because there was uh, this intersection of an, lots of different artists that would go there because it's just so naturally beautiful and the history um, is so intense there. So that was a very different place, this little sleepy Western town with dirt roads and low riders everywhere, you know, to all of a sudden Santa Fe style hit the runways. And when that happened, the whole city changed. The whole neighborhoods were quickly gentrified. There was a struggle to really keep an identity for a lot of families that had obviously been born and raised there. That who some, for some people their roots go back thousands of years there, and for others um, back to the 1500s. So that was a huge, I think, difficult transitionary moment. And I just happened to be growing up and part of it. Yeah. And we see that so often, uh, a lot these days with the whole gentrification. It reminds me of like Harlem, for example, how, you know, Harlem had its mm -hmm. thing back in the 1920s and 30s. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Completely. And, yeah. And, and with the Harlem Renaissance comes things like a gospel brunch for $120. I'm like, <laughs> okay, my grandmama's chicken never cost $120, <laughs> but they're promoting it as a thing, right? Mm -hmm. This um, sort of like destination to European tourists. Right. And it becomes Indeed. this very different animal. So when you I was reading that part about Santa Fe, that was like my mm -hmm. version of the uh, Ralph Lauren collection when, <laughs> when yeah, I read that. A great parallel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought so. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, also, again, you are obviously um, a renowned dancer and I love the um, support mm -hmm. you got from your family on that. And it's really interesting because for the time, I now told you before we, we began recording that you and I are very close in age. And with that mm -hmm. comes a very different America. Yes. But I think culturally it depends on where you are, who you are, who your parents are and families, how supportive you are of your little boy that's a little vibrant and colorful and wants to dance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you seem to have hit the jackpot with uh, <laughs> an amazing mom and dad who really nurtured right. that. But your mom with the costumes and I mean, the, the curtains and, you know, making your, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, just talk about the support that you got when mm -hmm. your mother and family decided that they were going to let you be who you are. Sure. Um, my parents were both visual artists and my father has since um, passed away. But my mother still makes, you know, her ink paintings and drawings every single day. So I grew up in a, a very active arts family. Um, but what was different was that I, you know, didn't have that propensity to be able to draw or to paint. And I was always looking for something as a child, like, what could I do? Mm. And so I remember watching this Liberace special on TV, <laughs> right? <laughs> And yeah, I thought, it all goes back to Liberace. It all goes back. And I thought, oh my gosh, this man um, is an entertainer. He's got these amazing clothes. He's just, everybody loves him up there on that stage. And I thought, I want to be a pianist because that's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> you get all the rings and everything. I thought, that's you get candelabras. Pianist, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so I told my parents, you know, I, I would like to play a piano. We need to get a piano. Well, my parents were in no financial place to be able to buy a piano. And so um, like a week later, my father said, oh, wear comfortable clothes and um, we're going to take you to your first class. And I thought, oh, yes, here comes my big chance. And my father dropped me off at a martial arts dojo instead of <laughs> karate dojo. And I thought, what is going on? But I actually loved it. And I ended up having um, sort of a Mr. Miyagi 
mentor before there was a karate kid, you know, before it was yeah. a film. And his name was Makio Nishida. So every single night I was um, taking martial arts classes and that changed my life because I learned the discipline of the body. Mm -hmm. And at a certain point, my father said, Oh, you know, why don't you go and try and take a dance class with your friend, um, Salome. And it's so funny. Her name was really Salome that like, like the biblical dancer. So I said, yeah. okay. So I took this class and I just fell in love with that too. And from that moment on, I thought, Oh, this is the perfect, um, confluence of art and beauty and um, discipline of the body. Mm -hmm. And this is what I'm going to do with my life. Yeah. And let's just be honest. You could also then like literally knock somebody out if they called you a negative. <laughs> <laughs> you could pretty much defend yourself from a negative uh, attack for being a dancer because that, you know, yeah. it came with the territory. I mean, in, in many cases, especially during mm -hmm. that time. And now, you know, I, as I was reading a lot about how you look to, you look at dance as this really connecting universal language for mm -hmm. cross culture, you know, to, to, to bring cultures together. I was reminded of being a little boy, like maybe seeing uh, the Nutcracker with Barishnikov for the first time on mm -hmm. PBS. And I didn't know what I was watching, but I was fixated on it. And it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. Mm -hmm. I was like maybe eight or nine. And had I not seen it on PBS, we didn't have money for Broadway and theater. I didn't go to Lincoln Center. And so I really understand that there is this ability to use the dance because that piece has no dialogue at all. That's just completely a whole like two hours of ballet. Right. And I didn't move for two hours. Like my mom loved when it was on. Because uh -huh. she didn't have to babysit <laughs> me. But I mean, I love that. So talk to me a little bit about how you utilize dance as a sort of collective language to connect people? I really create dances that um, bring out, I hope, a sense of empathy from the audience member. And in a way, creating a dance is very similar to writing a book because you start with a movement phrase, you have an idea, you have a concept you want to explore. You take that movement phrase and you you lengthen it and you edit it. And just like in a book that sort of becomes a chapter and then you start building more and more and more. And you have this, uh, these crescendos and decrescendos of the choreography. And there's just this whole exploration that happens. And sometimes I base choreography on a specific piece of artwork. Maybe it's a specific, um, social justice icon Maybe it's a certain story from the canon of our American history that hasn't been told before. And then there are dances which I create, which are really purely abstract. And I might just be really interested in a, in a musical score and hearing it performed live, juxtaposed to the live performance of the dance. So there are lots of ways that I approach things, but I would say overall in general, where my journey has led me is to this synergy of dance and the visual arts. And that's why so many of our performances happen in museums where they're based on um, great exhibits of visual arts. Yeah. I mean, cause now uh, with the work that you're doing with the Smithsonian, for example, you're their mm -hmm. first dancer choreographer in residence there. Right. I'm their first choreographer in residence. And even though I don't personally dance anymore, I still choreograph and um, teach classes to the company, right? We have 10 dancers. And um, it is a wonderful journey because at every museum I work with, whether it's the Smithsonian or if it's private museum, I'm able to work with curators, historians to really dig deeply into the social context in which an art piece was created, in which an artist's life occurred. And for me, it's always a learning process that then manifests itself into dance. And you are also bringing so much of your own personal story often to your work as well. Mm -hmm. And even in your book, obviously, your book sort of tells the story of how you have that intersectionality of being um, uh, Asian American, Mm -hmm. I'm also a member of the LGBT community right. and how all those things impacted who you were, who you are, and maybe where you're going. Mm -hmm. So I wonder when you wrote the book, 
was it cathartic? Was it difficult? Was it painful? Were you like, oh, I can't tell that story? You know, did you have to edit yourself? Or <laughs> what was the process like? <laughs> well, it was difficult at times. And I think it was difficult to remember being an outsider in a lot of moments of my life and then having to explore how I became an insider. How did I move from that outer circle into the center of the way I live my life? And growing up in a highly traditional old Catholic community um, in Santa Fe, that was very difficult in terms of coming out, in terms of being gay. And, you know, in our generation, it was a very different time than now. Right. Like, you know, now we start meetings and we ask what your pronouns are and, you know, but that was never the case. It was, it was like, don't ask, don't tell anything, you yeah. know, it's more like that. Right? Like none of it. Don't even none insinuate. Of it. Don't try it. Yeah. Right. I just remember over the years trying to make this psychological shift of, oh my gosh, I want to hold my fiance's hand, you know, in public. And it just still being very hard you know, very difficult to do that. And, you know, I've overcome that, of course, but it made me think about just kind of the traumatic experiences of growing up in a society that did not honor uh, gay marriage, did not honor um, gay partnerships when I was a child or a teenager, or even a young adult. So that was big. Yeah. In fact, in my notes, I wrote like, you know, I guess more specifically, it was like, well, you know, does that re-traumatize someone to have to go back and like, you know, revisit stories and revisit the situations? And so I think when you talk about moving into who you are and owning that, mm -hmm. we hear a lot about the authentic self and how you cannot thrive until you literally are able to own who you are and show up as that person without, without apology. Mm -hmm. So there's a story in your book about, uh, I think it was the fourth grade dance Yes. With the, you know, the fabulous bell bottom pants on. And uh, <laughs> and this is where I said, you know, you and me are very similar because I've had many a fourth grade dance outfits. <laughs> very same outfits and very same reaction from the faculty. I can uh -huh. show you <laughs> and stay right, up and students. Right. But, you know, uh, you had the village people shirt on, which specifically just the Indian. Yes. Just to call out, it was just Felipe Rose, who ironically is someone who I... Who, who would have thought I would have known him now today? And you might know him as well. Oh. Um, yeah, so it was funny when I read that. I was like, I got to tell Felipe about this. because like, Oh, in, that's great. Yeah, I'm literally going to tell Felipe Rose that he has to read this and point out where you mentioned him. Him, I mean, because that's a really, that's a very specific, um, particular person on that shirt for you, right? I'm thinking about when you, be, right. you being drawn to it. The body, he was very visually, you saw the male form. He was like you oh, know, the yeah. Native American. And so I. Mm -hmm. it makes perfect sense that that's what drew you to that particular village person, if you will. Oh, um, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but I mean, you, you weren't able to be you without ridicule in that moment and some, some difficulty. So, you know, share right. a little bit about that experience and how that sort of like shapes you today when you think mm -hmm. back on it. Well, I think there were a lot of experiences like that, that um, I had these moments of realizing like, oh my gosh, I'm perceived as the other, sort of like there's something freakish going on here, you know, and nobody's saying it out loud that he's gay or he's going to be gay or, you know, whatever, you know, but there are all these potential labels that are going to hit really soon. And I think that happens to a child is that around that time period, you know, there's such freedom in a child. And then all of a sudden as social, as they socialize around like fourth grade, fifth grade, it's like, there's this shutting down of that beautiful freedom, you know, of that, that freedom to just fly through society. Right. And I definitely felt that. Um, and then what happened is I ultimately grew up in this neighborhood um, called Casa Solana or the house where the sun shines onto it, essentially in Spanish. And this neighborhood was actually built over the leveled Japanese internment camp. And so that right after World War II, it housed like over 5,000 people, like one tenth the population of Santa Fe during World War II. 
when it was leveled after World War One, about 10 years later, they built this neighborhood called Casa Solana. And I ended up growing up in this neighborhood. And I remember one day that one of my friend's uh, relatives said, oh, you know, hey, Chino, which means, you know, like Asian or like Chinese looking person in, in um, Spanish. He said, you remind me of the guys that used to live here because during the war and we were running around his, you know, dirt yard and it had um, barbed wire kind of fencing around it, right, to keep animals out. And I just remember like thinking, what in the world is he talking about? But the way he said it was so terrifying that I just like ran home and I asked my dad, what is he talking about? And my dad said, oh, you know, there used to be a Japanese internment camp here. So he tried to explain to me, you know, executive order 9066 and why Japanese Americans during World War II were suddenly taken into these prisons. So that kind of was the first time also that I felt like, oh my gosh, you know, for being Asian American, I could go to prison. Like my rights could be taken away, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. yeah. So, it's really scary too, because so many uh, people don't know about the Japanese internment camps right. today, which is part mm -hmm. of the reason why, you know, this whole idea to suppress history is so um, disconcerting to me because mm -hmm. we already don't know what we should know in many cases. <laughs> so now there's a, an effort to make sure they don't know even more what they don't know. And I'm like, wow, mm -hmm. because um, to me, that is one of the most disturbing occurrences in American history. Mm -hmm. Then compound it with the possessions of the Japanese were taken and their homes land. confiscated, land. I mean, it is really one of the ugliest things. And uh, the fact that that's not really just really taught so that we don't mm -hmm. make that mistake again Um is really disturbing. So I can imagine how horrifying that was for you to, you know, to realize that was sort of your, someone was comparing you to that particular existence. Right. Those people were not welcomed. Really. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting about that time period too, is right before World War II, the California agricultural community was like 80, 90% Asian mm. and Asian American. But today it's less than 1%. Hmm. So that's, it, I mean, that's incredible. Right. And so, wow. you know, you really have to see the impact of really the systemic impact mm -hmm. of um, policy and um, really racism Yeah. on even owning land. Yeah. And it's mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately something we are still dealing with. Um, you know, from many aspects. And I, I wanted to believe, because again, as we say, we are part of, kind of close to the same age. Mm -hmm. And I really believed when I was growing up that we were moving towards a more, it seemed like we were on this really great path to a more unified society. Yes. You know, my parents, my mom was born in a segregated country. So that's just one generation mm -hmm. removed. But right. there I was in a, like a predominantly white school and I had diverse friends and I you mm -hmm. know, had access to many programs. And I thought we were going um, to a very different America than the one we are currently in, which mm -hmm. is very, very unfortunate. But that brings me to your role as a cultural ambassador for the U.S. State Department. And yeah. um, how did that come about? And, and what does that role entail? You know, it was a very serendipitous occurrence. I wish I could say I planned for it. I <laughs> had a strategic plan. But no, um, I was performing at the Kennedy Center, um, a solo that I had created and an individual from the State Department came backstage and said, we have a, a program in which we send artists out and we would like you to consider going out and representing the United States on some different performances and residencies. And so really I didn't know about that program until it happened. And ever since then I've um, had a relationship with the US State Department and been able to go out with um, either by myself or with my company and toured and really engaged with communities, not just in performance, but it's, you know, in ways that are amplified by teaching, by meeting with other artists, by collaborating, uh, really creating friendships. Because I think that diplomacy on a fundamental level is building a deep friendship that's going to last a long time. 
Yes. And I think that, you know, people who are outside of the country, um, we, and I say we as Americans, I'll generalize. I mean, I don't think I mean, a lot of us do travel, but a lot of us don't even have a passport. Right. Mm-hmm. And, uh, the first time you leave the country and you really interact with other people, it is so eye opening. You know, for me it was, and I was like, and I like left the country and I see people who have so much, maybe l- so little, maybe less than we have. Mm-hmm. And they're so happy or they're so content and they have a different outlook on life. And I think, you know, I think you have to travel and get outside of your bubble to understand and appreciate um, how others live, how they, mm-hmm how they exist and maybe makes you more appreciative for things you have. But do you find that there's a big reception when you're in these environments, when you go around to different countries and you're representing the U S what's the reception like? The reception is really um, in general, very, very fine. You know, communities are, I think always open to new information and to have discussions with other artists that will listen that want to understand their work as well. Because a large part of being um, a cultural envoy of sorts is not to, th- to believe that one is going into a community and is like the savior that's going to bring a certain pocket of knowledge from the United States that's going to be, you know, this amazing, <laughs> you know, you know um, community changing moment. Because actually it goes in both directions, right? I feel like I've been changed so many times by the beauty of the artists that I've met and the work that they do. And also I've been very humbled by seeing the struggles that individuals go through in order to make their work, you know, um, because I always come back to the United States and, and the culture shock for me is often in reverse. It's when I get back into the States and I have this whoa moment, you know, Because um, the United States, depending on where you've just visited, can feel like very opulent opulent and very overwhelming in a sense, you know. And yet there are countries that I have worked in where, and I write about it in the book, where for dancing, an individual's life is completely in danger. I mean, you know, I met a, a young dancer in... Pakistan along the Afghani tribal lands that had been shot for publicly dancing. And that was huge for me because when I came, it has somehow, you know, in, in my younger self, in my twenties had never crossed my mind that you could actually be killed for being a dancer. And yet seeing the courage that this dancer had and the passion to just continue in a life-threatening situation was for me life-changing. Yeah. I mean, were they, so not, uh, obviously not uh, fatally wounded, but were they, they were still dancing after this injury, after this situation, or they have been now impacted by it? it, When I met this dancer, um, he literally was on an IV drip Mm. and, you know, had, major bandages and couldn't walk well was still recovering because the shooting had happened um, not that long ago prior to me meeting him. And so I never found out, even though I acquired whether he danced again Hmm. or whether he was able to escape that particular situation. Mm. Yeah. Mm. That's unfortunate. And again, it shows you that you don't understand about how other people in the world are living until you really kind of step outside of your own front door and make that mm-hmm. effort to understand other cultures and, and speaking of other cultures and understanding nuances and mm-hmm. different things. Um, I love when you draw the distinction between um, the word Chino as a word of, of endearment or mm-hmm. potentially an insult. So another similarity I was mentioning to you about us is that I was raised around a lot of Hispanic people, but uh, Puerto Ricans specifically. Mm-hmm. And um I remember we had a friend who looked like he might have been of some Asian country and they uh-huh. called him Chino, uh-huh. but very endearingly. And mm-hmm. and they would call me Chino Moreno uh-huh. <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, I looked sort of like I could have been maybe part something and something, at the, you know. Right. And, uh, so, and I always looked at that as a term of endearment. So when I was reading your book, mm-hmm. I... I was reading it and then I was like, wait, I've, I've never known it that way. But then you drew the distinction between the two and now you actually embrace it. So speak a little bit about that word for you. My 
great grandparents came to America from Korea in 1903, and they were on the first ship of the first Koreans, the hundred individuals that came from Korea to Hawaii and settled in America. And so my family has always felt very proud about that. They ended up having indentured worker contracts on the plantations of Hawaii and having to pick uh, sugarcane and pineapples for generations, right? So it was not an easy life at all and a difficult to want, one to get out of. But there was always this real pride in being Korean, right? That somehow um, we knew where our ancestry was. We like really felt strong about that. So when I got to Santa Fe and the kids were like, hey, Chino, I'd be like, oh no, I'm Korean, you know? <laughs> like, like, clarifying, like, not Chinese. This guy to this like, you know, other third grader, like <laughs> right? trying yeah. to do like a geography <laughs> lesson of Asia. <laughs> just like, and they would be like, okay, okay, Chino. <laughs> right. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. So it used to it just frustrated me in it and it and you know, kids could tell it frustrated me, but I, maybe they didn't understand why or anything, you know, they didn't quite get what my passion was about trying to have people understand and differentiate, like, cause you know, Asian America is so diverse, right? But when I got older, um, I actually met a, um, when I was on tour in Peru, I met a, um, Peruvian dancer and we had this odd synergy, you know, he started dating um, and we kind of looked alike, which was wild too. And because he was part Asian or looked part, you know, had that look and, you know, I'm part Asian and his nickname was Chino also. And so there was this odd moment where I had this transference of loving the name Chino because I finally in an odd way had found a loving relationship to compare that name to, you know, in adult life. Oh, that's wonderful. Beautiful words to end on with Dana Tai Soon Barges, leading American choreographer and author of Chino and the Dance of the Butterfly, which is just, it's an awesome read. I think anybody, everybody will find something within those pages to identify with. So thanks for being here today. We appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much. It was a pleasure.